Okay, that's my cue. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's event. We're really happy you're all here. So the numbers are still rising, but we'll get we'll get started. Um, my name is Soha Ashrafi. I'm the director of research in the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School, and I'm really excited for today's event. I'm partnering with HBI uh, to host uh, Brain Rhythms 101, and we're really grateful for Dr. Sydney Cash to be joining us today. Um, so Dr. Cash is Associate Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School and an attending epileptologist at Mass General Hospital. He is also co-director of the Clinical Data Animation Center and the Center for Neurotechnology and Neurorecovery um, and director for research in the Partners Neurology Residency Program. Very busy person. So thanks for joining us. Um, Dr. Cash received his uh, bachelor's in biology at Yale College. Um, then he went on to pursue an MD PhD at Columbia University. Uh, he did his internship and residency in the neurology program at Brigham and Women's and Mass General, uh, where he was chief resident. Uh, following a fellowship in epilepsy at Mass General, um, he established his own lab at Mass General Harvard Medical School, where he studies the mechanisms underlying epilepsy and normal cognition. Intervo interwoven in much of this work is a deep interest in the oscillatory and rhythmic activity of the brain. And that is the focus for today's session. So before we, we, we move on, I just wanted to give a shout out to Akshay Jaggi, who I think is here, for um, coming to HBI, an MD-PhD student, um, coming to HBI um, with the suggestion for this really cool topic. Um, so just before we, I turn it over to Dr. Cash, we're going to hear a lecture. Hi, hi, Akshay. We're going to start a lecture. Uh, start your lecture um, for about forty-five minutes. Um, we, uh, Dr. Cash, is happy to take questions during his talk. Just raise your hand so uh, we can call on you. And there'll also be time at the end for more questions. We also have some pre-submitted questions. So, without further ado, Dr. Cash, thank you for for being here. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Akshay and Soha and everybody else who, who, who uh, invited me to do this and uh, to help set it up. Uh, I, I hope this turns out to be interesting to everybody on here. Let me say a few things before we even get started. Uh, first of all, yeah, I, I've done a few of these Zoom talks, seminars before. I don't know about everybody else. I find them relatively sterile, uh, more so than in person. Uh, and so I welcome people interrupting me and trying to break things up, especially because most of what I see is a bunch of black boxes, so I have no idea if I'm getting across in any way, shape, or form. So do feel free to, to interrupt. Um, also, what I'm going to try and be covering today is a huge topic, and a topic that many, many people have done a lot of work on, including some people who are on this call. And I want to say at the very beginning that I'm going to be glossing over lots of stuff, and I apologize if I gloss over your favorite thing. Uh, and I'm going to be trying to keep this at a level which is engaging and, and allows us to say, take a broad survey of the, uh, of the, of the questions that we're, we're looking at uh, and allow me to connect it from some really basic neurophysiology to some clinical uh, insights if possible, knowing that by being broad, it's gonna be hard to cover that and hard to do, hard to do everything. So again, that's where the questions I think can come in uh, handy and allow us to focus on things that are, that are interesting uh, to, to everybody. Uh, so then without further ado, let me, let me get started here. Um, so what I'm gonna start with is just talking a little bit about what are rhythms, what are they in the brain, or at least how are we defining them and talking about them for the sake of the next 45 minutes or so. And then I'll give a little bit of history which will get us into uh, the different rhythms. And then I'm just gonna sort of go through in a fairly systematic uh, process, sort of like you know, going through the zoology of, of uh, oscillations here, taking you know, each of the major oscillations in turn and giving you a little bit of a hint about how they're defined, uh, where they're found, what their mechanisms, uh, uh, what their mechanisms are, and where they might be uh, important from a clinical point of view or from a cognitive uh, point of view. Um, it's sort of a, you know a, a guide to the oscillations in a way. Uh, touching on a few other particular issues, aging and other issues, and then some pathology at the very end, and then try and sum up. So that's what I'm gonna that's what I'm gonna try and do over the next 45 minutes here. Um, so. Okay, there we go. So just, just really quickly, just to get some idea down without getting into too much of a semantic discussion here, uh, rhythms, oscillations, all sorts of different things that happen in the body and in biology. There are obviously clocks, something which sort of keeps time, 
we won't be talking about clocks today at all. That's a whole other fascinating area that I'm, there are people much more expert than I am that could talk about that, I'm sure. We're talking about rhythms and oscillations. You know, if you look up rhythms, you think of, a, or you look it up in a di dictionary, it says something like it's a strong, regularly repeated pattern. An oscillation is some repetitive variation of a measure around a central value. You know, I think most people, when we think of an oscillation, we have in mind a sine wave, something just going up and down sort of regularly. But it's a lot more complicated than that, obviously. And let me just uh, uh, have a listen here as, as we go on. Uh, this is Art Blakey playing, I think, in the 1950s, 1959, uh, amazing jazz drummer. Um, and, you know, what's nice about drums is it's one of our easiest ways of thinking about rhythms. But if you listen to even just a few minutes of this, or seconds of this, really, you see that there's some nice constant rhythms. You watch the hi-hat go in there. It's really, really constant. That's a regular repeated pattern. But there's all this other stuff overlaid on it. Uh, frankly, way too complicated for me to think about. He does it sort of without thinking, is my guess. He sort of does it naturally. And you'll watch all these different things happening and all these different uh, rhythms and patterns and oscillations going on. And that, I think, is a really decent analogy for what we're, what's going on in the brain. Like there's all this different activity happening. And what we're going to do today is try and take this apart and just look at different pieces of it. But I don't want anybody to forget that the oscillations that I'm talking about are like one or two beats of what he's doing in the context of this complicated uh, set of activity. So the kind of clocks, the kind of rhythms that we look at in biology, they span a huge range as well. You know, there are rhythms that take place over the course of months. Uh, and then there are rhythms and oscillations that take place over the course of milliseconds. We're generally, because it's brain activity, focusing on activity that's occurring on the order of milliseconds and seconds. And that's where we're going to be focusing our attention today. Again, there is uh, uh, lots of oscillations and lots of rhythms outside of that domain as well. All right. So we're also covering a number of different um, uh, um, uh, spatial resolutions as well. So we're really going to be talking about from the microscopic, where you can sort of think of spike trains in an individual neuron, that is, actual potentials that are elicited in a given neuron for a given uh, input or stimulation. You can sort of see an example here from a uh, layer five neuron in a mouse where it has a bunch of spikes on it. Uh, and that itself is an oscillation or can be an oscillation to sort of looking more in sort of the mesoscopic domain where there's an interaction of local groups of neurons uh, which produce a local field potential or local potentials. By the way, I don't know if other people have stuff scribbled on their screen. Yeah, I see that too. Okay, well, I just I don't know where it came from, but I got rid of it. Oh, it's gone now. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, and then finally, up to the to the macroscopic level, where um, you know we are, we're looking at dynamics of large groups of neurons, and that's where we're going to be spending spending most of our effort over the next uh, few minutes, uh, talking about what we see when we look at the dynamics in large groups of neurons. We'll bounce back and forth to the other levels as well, particularly as we think about mechanism. Uh, but we're we're really looking mostly you know, at the level of the EEG, at the dynamics of large, large groups of neurons. All right, so that's, that's where we're going to keep our focus. So how do we measure? I went, when I was asked to talk about this, I, there was a, a quick hint to talk a little bit about how one measures this. I'm going to gloss over this very briefly. We could spend easily the whole time and much, much more uh, talking about the ins and outs of how measure oscillations are defined in neural systems, how they could be measured and quantified. Uh, and uh, it's actually an area of, of considerable growth uh, and experimentation and advancement nowadays. Uh, but there's some basics that are sort of predicate notions. And, and the real uh, basic of it is sort of a spectral decomposition of, of Fourier transform where you take a signal and you take it apart uh, into different sub oscillations that are then combined uh, to make to make the full signal initially, and that's really the basis for uh, the majority of work that's happened in this field, and certainly the early work that led to a definition of different bands. And so, in this uh, one panel here on the upper left side, um, uh, you, you see a spectrogram. Uh, of a typical EEG from uh, a normal healthy person uh, showing you know, power in low frequency bands and then uh, lesser power in higher frequency bands and a big peak at the alpha band, which I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes. And this kind of data can then be resynthesized into a visual 
uh, visually pleasing output using a spectrogram where you could look at the distribution of power in different frequency bands, uh, colorized and then shown over time. Here's just an example from uh, a sleep EEG that was done showing the typical uh, spectrogram during periods of different sleep stages and during uh, intermittent periods of wakefulness. And then you can go on beyond this and you could focus on one area here. I just circled a, about a 10 to 12 hertz band of activity, which corresponds to spindles during sleep. We'll talk about those as well. And there are tools that you could use to pull out that band of interest and focus on it and uh, make, make determinations about uh, the actual uh, rhythmicity and amplitude and how it changes and what its structure actually is. So there's a whole host of techniques that could be layered on top of this, or in fact, can substitute for this that allows us to look at different oscillations in different ways. And again, it's sort of getting back to Art Blakey. It's taking that very complicated uh, music as it were, uh, and, and peeling it apart to pull out specific oscillations that are consistent and analyzable uh, is, the, is the name of the game and how this is generally done. And this all started uh, over, well, almost a hundred years ago uh, with, with this gentleman, Hans Berger, uh, uh, who uh, was developing uh, measures of brain activity and basically the early EEG. Uh, now is our first couple of decades in the 1900s, along with a few other people at the same time, but he was the one who sort of uh, got it done uh, uh, first. And it's really him and his son, because what he did is he, and I'm not sure that we could do this nowadays, uh, probably not sort of IRB approved. Uh, he took his son and he stuck a couple electrodes on the back of his head and started recording. And that's actually what you're looking at here. This is the EEG and then a timing trace uh, from that recording from his son. Uh, and you can see there's a nice uh, waveform here that is very periodic and matches the 10 hertz timing trace quite nicely. And this was the first recording of what uh, was first known as the uh, Berger uh, rhythm uh, and later became known as the as alpha. Uh, well, actually he termed it as alpha, uh, the alpha wave. And so this is really the first uh, indication of oscillations. There have been other studies or studies around that same time in, in animals talking, beginning to talk about rhythmic activity uh, in, in brain or in uh, neural systems, but it really wasn't until the EEG came along uh, that the, this full notion of an oscillatory activity or multiple different oscillatory activities in the brain uh, began to be developed. And it took uh, the next several decades before it really uh, even matured into a well-defined nomenclature and uh, phenomenology understanding these, these, different, uh, these different rhythms. And the, the major ones uh, that were, were first sort of talked about are shown here, uh, starting at the top edge of the slide with faster frequencies and going down to slower, uh, the beta band, the alpha band, the theta band, and the, and the delta band. And these were largely recognized purely by eye. This was done you know, looking at a bunch of traces and seeing these rhythms and then giving them names and recognizing that they had uh, sort of parameters around them without necessarily knowing uh, any sort of uh, mechanistic information at that time. And so now we have a bunch of different named oscillations or frequency bands of interest. As I just mentioned, started on the left-hand side at lower frequencies. There are delta, there's delta activity, there are slow waves of sleep, there's theta, alpha and beta and sleep spindles, and gamma, high gamma, which is also called epsilon. And then there's high frequency oscillations and very high frequency oscillations. And in the red little uh, uh, fake graph here, uh, I show you that there are some attributes that go along with these different frequency bands and the uh, activity in them uh, that are sort of generalized, the generalized um, uh, features. That is, as you move particularly from the lowest and slowest uh, activity on the left-hand slide up to theta and alpha, you're generally seeing uh, a greater arousal or greater ability to do conscious activity. At the same time, the general rule is that as you move from those lower frequencies to the higher frequencies, you go from fairly widespread and synchronous across the brain to increasingly focal and, uh, a and presumably asynchronous. And you also go from more continuous, that is it's an ongoing oscillation, to more of a bursting where you'll get little ch chunks of, of time in, the, um, in that frequency band of, of interest. Now those are general rules and I'll refer back to them a few more times, but they're also rules that are broken uh, uh, quite a bit. So let's start with the, the delta and slow oscillations. These are generally defined as rhythms in the one to four hertz 
uh, range. There are rhythms and activity that's lower than that, the so-called infraslow activity going down to DC activity. Uh, it's a whole very interesting area of uh, research, um, uh, but requires specialized recordings that haven't been done quite as much. But in the delta band, we're in this one to four hertz activity. This is seen in drowsiness, and especially during sleep and stage three sleep, where these really coalesce into slow wave uh, activity. It's also seen in pathological circumstances and really almost any brain injury. Uh, so it's a very nonspecific finding when the cortex in particular has sustained an injury. And that could be uh, the existence of a tumor or a traumatic brain injury, um, uh, longstanding neurodegenerative disease, et cetera, will all show this kind of slowing. On the left-hand side here, I'm showing an, an EEG, multiple channels of an EEG, showing these large amplitude, relatively slow waves that are occurring at about once per second. Each of these vertical gray lines uh, is one second. And so you can see these big peaks about once every second or so. On the right-hand side is another EEG, this time from a patient, uh, well, a participant who was healthy. And this is, uh, this is a sleep, a uh, period of sleep where you have these slow oscillations during sleep as, as well. And by eye, they're not very distinguishable. There are certain characteristics of them that are uh, different between the two situations, but the overall rhythm and the overall structure of it is largely the same between uh, pathology and, um, uh, and, and sleep itself. This is actually probably the best studied or best understood oscillation uh, in terms of really uh, getting down to a, a pretty complete description of both the cellular and network interactions that underlie the generation of, of slow waves, particularly slow wave sleep. And a lot of this uh, we owe to uh, Stereot and work he did in the 90s, uh, along with a number of his uh, postdocs who were uh, both amazingly productive and amazingly detailed in some very elegant work uh, on this project using uh, primarily cat, but also rodent uh, preparations during sleep and anesthesia and other circumstances. And what they basically uh, demonstrated was that a lot of the slow oscillation is largely driven by layer five pyramidal neurons, particularly bursting layer five pyramidal neurons. And then this leading to an alternation between an up state, that is a depolarized state when there's a lot of synaptic input and a lot of firing, and then a down state, a hyperpolarized state uh, where there's essentially quiescence. And you can see that in, as an example in, in A in this panel from, from uh, a seminal stereoid paper from 1993, uh, showing this bursting up states with uh, quiescence in between that gives you uh, that slow oscillation rhythm. And by the way, when you look at this, one of, the, one of the things that often gets a little bit lost is that we tend to think of the slow oscillation, like many oscillations, and as I mentioned at the very beginning, as a sine wave, as a sort of perfectly uh, smooth and continuous event. And it really isn't, it's, it's quite asymmetric. Uh, and you can see that asymmetry right in the in the single cell uh, physiology that underlies it. There's sort of a bursting state that has a different duration and a different onset than does the slower quiescent down state. And so you get the asymmetry from there as well. Uh, and this has been uh, not only demonstrated in these sort of animal preparations, but also in in vitro preparations and slice preparations and undercut cortex, uh, uh, further suggesting that this is really largely driven by the cortical cells. However, it's also very clear that the thalamus does play a role, that there are very important thalamocortical loops that sculpt the oscillation that can modify its spatial extent, its frequency, uh, some of the rise times, and there's still ongoing debate as to exactly what and how a given oscillation, a given slow oscillation can be initiated, uh, whether the thalamus can drive that directly or whether the cortex has to drive, has to drive that. So there's still some open questions here, but uh, this general framework for how this oscillation originates uh, is, is fairly well worked out at this point in time. Um, but some of the aspects that we originally thought to be the case about slow oscillations and some of what I mentioned in that first sort of uh, hokey slide with the, with the red curve on it, uh, you know, we think of the slow wave and generally things in the delta range as very widespread and quite um, uh, uh, synchronized across the cortex. But actually more, more recent work, and this is a very nice paper from, from Nier and Tononi uh, back in 2011, using microelectrodes in patients with epilepsy uh, to study the slow oscillations in particular. And, and they, along now with, with some other research that's been done, has shown that in fact, these kinds of slow oscillations can be very highly localized. They can be very focal in their origins 
and they could be generated by units in a very localized area without necessarily uh, clear generation elsewhere or without synchrony uh, in other areas of cortex. So uh, there's really sort of a, a, a shift in or a break in that rule that I first laid down, the, the first of the rules that I'm going to talk about breaking, that uh, even though it's uh, uh, slow, it doesn't necessarily need to be perfectly widespread and perfectly synchronous. There can be some uh, real focality to it. Um, there are other re uh, rhythms in sleep, and we could spend our entire time just talking about not sleep, but even just these elements in sleep. There are things called K-complexes, which are not really rhythmic, but have a lot of the same characteristics of the as the slow wave itself. Uh, there are spindles as well, which are a 10 to 15 hertz oscillation that I'll talk about in a few minutes when we get up to that range. There are vertex waves and some other elements uh, that are seen in sleep as, as, as well. Uh, but the major component that we think about in sleep and in pathology are these slow oscillations in the delta range uh, in the one to four hertz range. The theta band is from four to eight hertz. Uh, it is seen in drowsiness, but can also be seen in, in, in wakefulness. Uh, it's also been studied in a number of different preparations and there could be divided up into a bunch of different subtypes, suggesting perhaps that there are actually multiple thetas with multiple theta mechanisms. Uh, one common way of, of dividing it, or at least thinking about it, is to separate cortical theta from hippocampal theta, again with the idea that there's probably different mechanisms involved. This EEG in the upper right-hand corner is again from a healthy patient showing a fairly pronounced uh, theta activity uh, over a widespread area cortex, but mostly centered in the temporal lobe. Um, the little red box is showing uh, just a, a cleanest example of that. The other, you see it in other channels on this EEG. Uh, I won't yet go through the, the EEG nomenclature and, and what indicates what exactly. You just have to trust me for a few minutes at least uh, that this is a, a, a temporal theta for the most part. Uh, generated almost certainly from the cortex. On the other hand, the, the best studied versions of theta really are probably in the hippocampus of, of mice, uh, where the mechanisms that generate theta still remain debated, and again, probably comes down to multiple forms of theta under different states and different circumstances. But it's thought to be an interplay between some of the intrinsic neuronal properties, as well as uh, reciprocal interactions between subregions of the hippocampus, for example, enterinal cortex communication with the CA1 region, and back again in training the theta activity. Uh, it has been implicated quite a bit in uh, sensory processing, spatial navigation, and memory in particular, uh, in both animal models and in uh, humans, um, uh, but still somewhat of an open debate exactly what role it plays and how it plays that role. And it is also seen in pathology uh, in that excessive theta under certain circumstances could indicate under underlying brain injury. Uh, so it's not always a, a, a functional rhythm as far as we know. Now, uh, Dr. Cash. Yes. Hello. Uh, so I, I'm curious if you can talk at least a bit briefly about how people approach showing the necessity or sufficiency of a specific frequency band in generating uh, yeah, these so, behaviors. So you you jumped to I think my penultimate slide, um, okay. right. <laughs> which is, which is I, I, so I I, uh, I I said that it plays some role, and you'll notice lots of hedging words there, and you're going to see a bunch more hedging words coming up. Uh, you know where I'm un, un, uh, uncomfortable saying you know theta does X, and that's because the while there's a lot of clear cut associational studies or correlative studies. You know, we do a memory study and we show that when the memory function for a particular um, uh, stimulus is, is solid, the theta was high. And when the memory was bad, the theta was low. Uh, or we show that in patients who have trouble with a certain task, their resting, uh, resting theta was, was not as good, something like that. And then there's a few optogenetic experiments where we induce rhythms of various sorts and uh, enhance memory or enhance a particular processing. Uh, those are the typical ways that it's done, but the majority of work, not all of it, but the majority of work uh, that I'm aware of is uh, really showing a correlation. that These things are going up at the same time or going down at the same time. Uh, it gets a little bit more nuanced than that, showing some a uh, little bit more statistically interesting relationships, for example, phase locking and or, or destruction of phase relationships or things like that, that can have an effect on the behavior. Uh, but again, I, I think 
uh, it's it's uh, one could argue, but it's I think mostly correlative, and there's not nearly enough uh, really true, functional, uh, sufficient, and necessary experiments. And that's because those are really really hard experiments to do, right? Because it's very very hard to imagine reducing, destroying, upsetting, offsetting one of these os oscillations and not messing up a whole lot of other things at the same time. They're so uh, you know, uh, intrinsically woven into the uh, activity of neurons in a normal fashion, the interrelationship of neurons that how do you take them apart without taking apart other things and keep things controlled? So it's a real challenge and a challenge that you know, labs are getting to, right? They're, they're figuring out tricks to do this kind of thing and that's the way things are heading. But it is, it's a great question. It's to some extent the, the uh, well, we don't do millions anymore. The billion dollar question, uh, you know, how do you, how do you actually take these things apart and make really strong statements about that? All right, and we'll come back to that at the end. Uh, maybe so, so now, then there's alpha, and alpha again is sort of the granddaddy of, of the rhythms, the first one recognized, one of the easiest ones to see. This is an EEG from a person, it actually happens to be from me, uh, doing a very simple task where I open and close my eyes. And on the left-hand side of this screen uh, over here, uh, you can see that there's some rhythm going on in the background. And then there's this period of the red line here where uh, I open my eyes and that rhythm goes away. And that's the classic alpha, uh, the classic alpha rhythm. Uh, it's seen at quiet rest with the eyes closed. It's also known as the posterior dominant rhythm. This is really an EEG's, EEG's terminology. You won't see that much other place uh, than that, but it's expected to be seen in someone who's healthy and is a good indication of relative health of, of, of the cortex um, and generally uh, absent or decreased in patients with a whole host of different uh, neuropsychiatric uh, difficulties. Now the alpha, despite being the oldest and longest studied rhythm of the lane, the mechanisms of it are still uh, pretty unclear at this point in time. Uh, and again, part of that might be confounded by different forms of alpha, uh, but also just it's just a little bit trickier to look at. There's one set of mechanistic theories that, that really posit that the pulvinar or LGN is the primary driver of the, of the alpha rhythm and its projections to the occipital cortex are the main uh, pathways through which the alpha rhythm is uh, initiated. There's a sort of contrasting theory is that it's infragranular uh, layer five pyramidal neurons, again, that are mostly responsible for generating uh, the alpha rhythm. And then there's sort of a, a, a halfway idea that it's feedback uh, to the upper cortical layers, that is top-down feedback coming from higher area, area associational areas. And this is a, 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 a mechanism that we've been exploring. Uh, I'm just, I'm going to, by the way, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, I'll be showing some data from my lab, not because it is necessarily the best or most important, but it's the some that I'm most familiar with, frankly, uh, and lets me illustrate points, uh, but please don't take that to mean that it's definitive in, uh, in any kind of way. This is work that uh, Mila Halgren uh, did in my group a while ago, looking at uh, laminar microelectrode arrays in patients with uh, intractable epilepsy who are undergoing surgery, and just looking at the spontaneously generated alpha rhythms and we always saw uh, in, in these recordings that the majority of the power uh, for the alpha rhythm and the clearest alpha rhythm were in the upper cortical layers uh, near the peel surface, suggestive of uh, feedback information coming to those, those layers, uh, generating that kind of oscillation. So uh, we think that, that this kind of alpha that we're looking at is being generated by input from other areas. And in fact, if we look at the uh, how these alpha waves propagate and how alpha itself propagates. It's actually found throughout the brain, although we, we think of it as a primarily posterior, that is occipital rhythm, you actually can find it pretty much everywhere in the brain. Uh, in fact, there's separate alphas that are prominent in the motor cortex called the mu rhythm. Uh, there's a mid temporal alpha as well. And there's, you can see alpha in the frontal lobe. And it's not really static. It's not that it's just present in, in one place, but that it propagates. There are sort of waves of alpha activity and alpha, uh, each individual alpha cycle can propagate. And you see that here, this is a color coded map of a grid of electrodes that was placed on the cortex of a patient with epilepsy. And again, we recorded during alpha. And the alpha actually starts in the upper right corner of that grid and goes down to the lower left corner. So there's this pattern of propagation of alpha waves that goes from anterior and higher order 
uh, cortices down to posterior and lower order. And we saw that in multiple patients and also in frontal areas where, again, the propagation is generally from the higher order uh, uh, areas, sort of associative areas to uh, uh, closer to primary sensory areas or primary uh, areas of cortex. So, you know, one, one concept then for this alpha, uh, which has been considered to be an important um, element of top-down cognitive processing, including attentional networks and perception networks, as well as working memory, with this overlying idea that the alpha rhythm is some sort of uh, functional inhibition. It's a gating mechanism, right? And, and that's why it's sort of present at quiet rest. As soon as you do anything particularly active, it, it, it goes away. And the idea there is when you're at rest and want to be at rest, it's sort of keeping everything tamped down, is keeping that particular set of information relatively constrained. When you start to actually process, now that information is free to flow and the alpha is keeping is no, is no longer needed or no longer wanted to keep that. And that's sort of consistent with this propagation pattern and the supergranular activation we see that there's sort of top-down control uh, uh, having a, some sort of a gating effect or at least uh, modifying. Uh, inputs into primary uh, sensory areas. And then when the alpha uh, is, is um, released, then you can get uh, information through in a different, in a different fashion. Uh, one, one possibility is that this takes place during perception. So I show up here the, the uh, very famous illusion of the uh, old woman or the young woman with a scarf kind of thing. And when you flip back and forth between them, uh, you know, is alpha somehow gating that process is one of the theories that's out there that that we and others are, are working on to try and understand that. But that's sort of the, the general mechanistic concepts that are uh, floating around from alpha at this point. The beta band will go up a little bit higher now, uh, variously defined. There's, there's different uh, ideas about exactly where beta starts and stops. Uh, 12 to 20 Hertz is the uh, given idea. And I just want, now I'm gonna take this moment because it's variously defined. We talk about these as bands, uh, but really an oscillation shouldn't be a band. An oscillation really strictly divine should really be a frequency. Uh, but for various analytic reasons, as well as biological reasons, uh, that's very challenging to do. And uh, so instead, what we really rely on is talking about the bands of activity and, and looking at it that way. We could talk more afterwards about that particular problem and, and some of the ways that people are, are trying to solve that. But that's why you keep hearing me sort of bounce back and forth between calling things bands and oscillations and rhythms and so on. Uh, it depends a lot exactly how you want to define it, but for now we're sort of lumping them all together. So the beta band, and you're seeing again, a, a, a couple different things occurring here in this EEG from a perfectly healthy person. Uh, I, I pointed out the alpha rhythm that's, that's showing up. You see it there in the upper right very clearly, but it's present elsewhere. But there's this um, faster activity that you can see as well, which is beta band activity. And again, it's present in, in normal situations, uh, totally expected to be there. It's maximal in front of central regions, uh, but, but it also could be present elsewhere and seen elsewhere. It is mostly there in normal wakefulness, but it is known to be very highly regulated by a variety of pharmacological manip manipulations, particularly benzodiazepines, barbiturates, chloral hydrate, tricyclic antidepressants. They all increase beta fairly substantially. Uh, and, and you can see that in EEGs very clearly. You'll see a much larger EEG, a much larger beta activity in a patient, for example, who's who's taking benzodiazepines. It's also something that appears to be increased in anxiety, both in anxiety as a uh, state and anxiety as a uh, intermittent uh, event uh, also increases beta. Uh, over the motor cortex in particular, beta is, uh, is present and is enhanced during an isotonic muscle contraction and then suppressed prior to and during active movements, you know, specific goal-directed movements. And this is an example that I, I took from a, a, just a, a paper looking at this uh, from Torcillos. Uh, in the uh, panel right here, you're seeing in the black, uh, the beta band power in sort of a normalized way. And in the light gray behind it is the movement. So there's a period right here where there's, uh, uh, you know, holding off on moving and then the movement uh, gets started right at this dashed line. Uh, and you see that there's a beta increase right beforehand, keeping it in check. And then uh, the beta is decreased during movement. You can see that in the spectrogram down below as well, uh, this big blob of beta uh, before the movement and then a decrease right during the movement. Um, now, again, so this would suggest that beta has some role, sort of like alpha, in 
being inhibitory in some sense, but the, it's, it's more complicated because uh, it is present in these isotonic contractions. So it's sort of a difference of the kind of movement that's seen and its role elsewhere in the cortex, not over motor cortex is really unclear at this point. At this point, you know what is what is it doing and what is it what is it there for? Uh, its mechanisms are equally unclear. The the you know basic idea is that it's going to involve GABA mediated inhibitory inputs. The majority of evidence for that notion really comes from the fact that the medications that cause a major change uh, in uh, in beta activity are a very clear GABAergic uh, um, impact. Uh, so it's thought that there's got to be a GABA mediated uh, part of the pathway resulting in, in beta band activity itself. But this is really a, a, a frequency uh, oscillation that's really not very well understood when all is said and done. I'll, I'll, it's not a digression, but let me talk about sleep spindles for a little bit. They're in this same range. Uh, they're also 7 to 15, 10 to 15, 12 to 15 hertz activity, again, variously de de defined. Uh, but they're really quite distinct. They are short runs of oscillations that last from a half second to a few seconds long. They occur normally during stage two sleep. They are one of the first rhythms uh, really well described, described by, by Loomis et al. Fascinating guy from scientific point of view. If you're interested in sort of history of science, uh, look him up. He's, a, he's an interesting character. Um, but he, he, he looked at these spindles and identified them. And you can see an example of them on the right-hand upper panel there. Uh, during sort of a, a, a period of sleep lasting a few seconds long and then just a really brief period of, they're really distinct, sort of slightly football shaped. They have a general start out low and get higher in amplitude and then decrease lasting only about a second or so that are seen during sleep. And there are another oscillation that's been fairly well studied. And again, because of stereoids uh, uh, capabilities and all that that group did, uh, looking at the cellular mechanisms that uh, uh, allow for this. And there's this interplay between uh, intrinsic currents and both uh, local and distant, particularly thalamocortical circuits and pacemakers. And I won't go through the details of, of uh, all the uh, intrinsic conductances that are necessary to uh, generate or sufficient to generate the spindle both locally and uh, synchronize it through thalamocortical loops. Uh, but it's a fairly well-defined uh, mechanism and, and fairly well uh, laid out. However, initially it was thought, just like for the slow oscillations in sleep, um, uh, that the, these events are widely distributed and synchronously distributed throughout the cortex. And like the slow oscillation, that turns out to probably be less true and for various reasons. Uh, this was work we did looking at this question using a combination of uh, magnetoencephalography and EEG. Uh, and on EEG, as was described back in the 1930s, uh, the spindle is seen as a relatively coherent oscillation covering a wide area of scalp. This colorized spectrogram box in the upper part here is EEG, and you can see everything lines up really nicely. It's pretty monomorphic. At the same time, the, the magnetometers, the gradiometers and magnetometers from the MEG show a very different story with sort of cascading waves uh, that change in their relationship to each other at different areas of, of the cortex. So this would suggest there's something a bit more going on with spindles that makes them a little bit less synchronous uh, than, we originally, than we originally thought. And in fact, if you go intracranially, and this is a busy slide, but the, the whole point is that it is busy. This is from a patient with a series of electrodes placed in the parenchyma of the brain to localize their seizures. They sleep during the period they were recording them. We could pull out spindles during that sleep period and uh, you see it's sort of a mess, right? Rather than having everything lined up and a whole series of oscillations overlaid on each other really pretty uh, and nice and clean, you see that there's a whole lot of complicated phase relationships uh, between these different recording sites. So, uh, and there's some channels that have no spindle on it when there's a big spindle elsewhere and then vice versa and it switches and it moves around. So there's a lot of complexity and, and nuance there in terms of what's actually generating the spindle uh, in the cortex, at least in, in humans. And in fact, there's a propagation pattern, one that really is quite similar to what we saw in the alpha, where the initial activity, the leading activity in the spindle tends to be in uh, higher order uh, uh, um, areas that then propagates to uh, lower order areas, at least in a certain sense. Again, we could discuss exactly, but it's basically uh, you know, going from anterior to posterior, uh, uh, anterior to posterior temporal, uh, 
uh, regions as it as it propagates, as the spindle propagates. And it more than just spreads, it actually has a more uh, um, structured uh, um, sense to it. So this is a movie, will be a movie, I hope, there we go, of uh, spindles across the cortical surface with a grid of electrodes, again, in a patient with epilepsy. Uh, and uh, here, this is work by Terry Sanowski's group and uh, uh, Muller, who was a postdoc in his group at the time, or grad student in his group at the time, um, looking at the phase of the spindle. And you can see it sort of, you sort of get this rotating uh, spiral of activity. It's sort of uh, spinning around uh, in a, in, during the course of a given spindle with um, uh, sort of millisecond resolution. And the idea uh, is that what this might be setting up is uh, the potential uh, possibility to elicit uh, mechanisms for synaptic strengthening based on uh, you know, short-term plasticity and spike-based um, spike timing-based plasticity. That is, if the spindle, uh, as it rotates, there's a phase shift uh, between uh, different spindles at different time points that can allow you to uh, uh, get different areas correlated with a different and a very particular time lag in between them, allowing you to uh, adjust or make use of specific mechanisms of plasticity. We don't know that for sure at all, uh, but it's sort of a, a, an idea. And the reason why this makes might make a little bit of sense is because there's a whole series of other data uh, suggesting that spindles play a very important role in the memory consolidation that can occur during sleep. And in general, in, in, in situations where sleep is disrupted or sleep is not normal based on other pathologies, uh, spindles often are decreased and learning memory is decreased amongst, amongst other things. So that gets to uh, Akshay's uh, original point. This is again, one of those things where there's a bunch of correlations allowing us to come up with hypotheses, but not necessarily an absolute uh, functional connection where we've, where we've proven how these things interact. Uh, but at least the detailed mechanisms are, are giving us more and more clues to what could be, could be possible. Finally, well, almost finally, we'll get to gamma. Gamma band activity is in the higher range. It is very variably defined. It goes from 20 hertz or 40 hertz or 30 hertz up to around 140. The key frequency was originally 40 hertz uh, range. Uh, there's also a ripple band that people talk about at 80 hertz. And then there's fast or high gamma, also called epsilon, above 90 hertz or above 80 hertz. Again, we could spend a, a couple more of these sessions just talking about gamma. It's a fascinating rhythm. It's been described all over the brain, in neocortex, and entorhinal cortex, down the hippocampus and the thalamus, et cetera. It is generally seen or thought of as a focal event, but there's again, uh, the, as I try and break the rules, uh, a number of experiments showing that it can propagate and it can co-occur co -occur or be synchronous. This is uh, data that's under review from Eric Halgren uh, using, again, intracranial recordings in patients, showing that if you uh, find a bunch of ripples on separate channels, you do that completely separately, you'll see that they actually uh, co-ripple, they co-occur or nearly co-occur at a, at a very high and much higher than statistically expected rate, uh, and they could actually overlap in time exactly. So there's some synchrony going on, at least at the level of the ripple itself, and in fact, there's some newer data suggesting there's a phase relationship there uh, as well. Um, and uh, there are a number of models of what um, generates the, the gamma. And this is taken from a review that Buzaki and Wang wrote in 2012. And, there's, and, and Buzaki is an important person to mention because he's done really seminal work all over the, the, the field of these oscillations. And if you're really interested in these, these questions, he has a wonderful book out uh, from many, if not many, a number of years ago now, Rhythms of the Brain that I highly recommend. It's very readable uh, and, and goes through a lot of these different ideas in much more depth than I'm doing here. But in this, in this review, he talks about different models for the gamma oscillation. Uh, there's a model in which you only need inhibitory interneurons and that can generate gamma. And then there's a model in which there's uh, excitatory inhibitory interactions uh, that allows you to, to generate the gamma as well. And it might be that both of these models are actually accurate. It just depends on either the state or the given region of the brain. Uh, and there are actually other models as, as well. And which one is in play at any given time is, is something we still have to work out and see how it uh, plays with the, with the different uh, in, uh, forms of gamma in different areas. Uh, the gamma is most closely associated with the binding problem, uh, and that's particularly the 40 hertz gamma, uh, although um, it wasn't actually called gamma when it was associated with the binding problem initially. But the idea is that this fast oscillation would allow you to uh, at least 
uh, somewhat synchronize information on different streams and therefore pull a percept together uh, in, in brain space in some way. And so it's therefore thought that gamma is highly related to perception and attentional mechanisms and, and memory functions. And we see its dysfunction or at least alterations in a very wide range of neuropsychiatric problems. Schizophrenia, mood disorders, Alzheimer's all have uh, uh, um, ab ab aberrant uh, uh, gamma activity seen both at rest and during uh, task dependent experiments. Um, now, as I'm, as I'm going to wrap up, I, we talk about these frequencies or these oscillations sort of in a, as separate entities. It's important to recognize, and this is something the field, uh, you know, has really been uh, exploring much more in the last five years or 10 years, that there's a lot of interactions between the frequencies. That is, they're not completely isolated events that sort of pop on and off by themselves, but that oscillations gate or constrain or sculpt or mold the other os oscillations. And there's many examples of this. Uh, the upstate of, of slow oscillations, for example, is characterized by high frequency activity and often by spindles riding on top of it, whereas the downstate is quiescent and there isn't a lot of other oscillations. So there's a gating there. And gamma has been well recognized, particularly in animal models, but now in some human studies, to be phase coupled to theta across different regions. And there's an example of this that I'm showing from a paper from Tamura uh, from a few years back on the bottom of the screen or some uh, relatively slow activity in the theta band and uh, near the theta band. You can see above that the gamma band is relatively phase lock coming a bit after the peak of, of those theta waves. Uh, you get these uh, little runs of gamma for, for three to five cycles or, or so on. So there's a clear phase relationship between uh, these different um, oscillatory mechanisms. And that's, again, that's very well recognized across many different relationships. Generally, though, the lower frequency is gating. Uh, the upper frequency or is affecting the upper frequency is, is generally what's been shown. Um, and this can occur at a location or it could occur across locations. So it could be from one area to another, often the hippocampal theta uh, gating cortical uh, gamma, for example, is, is, a, is one example that's often seen. The mechanism for this that have been suggested are quite varied. Uh, and they're really not well understood or well proven, you know, exactly what are the cellular interactions and the network interactions that allow this uh, to happen. And more and more evidence is, is uh, coming out that shows that this coupling can be diminished or shifted or altered in various ways in many different disease states. In epilepsy, for example, we see that at the very beginning of seizures, there's often um, much greater coupling between uh, theta frequency, for example, and uh, uh, spindle frequency, beta frequency, and gamma frequency, that this suddenly the coupling goes up, at least in some seizures, some of the time. So there's, you know, other interactions that are occurring under pathological states uh, that are revealed by looking at these coupling mechanisms. Uh, and then finally, I, I talk about, I, I've been talking about these frequencies as if they are a static entity. In fact, they are quite dynamic over development and over age. Uh, there's a progression of the different contributions of these oscillations uh, during time. So this is work from Kat Chu from a number of years back, looking at uh, different oscillations during sleep. And you can just see looking at this, at this spectral uh, analysis on the left-hand side and then broken out into different bands on the right-hand side that at you know, early, early development from uh, birth to a few months, there's a very different spectral pattern than we see at a year or two years old, which is still quite different than we see uh, when a, a kid starts getting into eight, nine, and 10 years old. Uh, the frequencies that are present and how and how robust they are changes over time. And this is true uh, all the way across the, 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 uh, age, the age range. This is uh, work from uh, Haoshi's son and Brandon Westover's group, looking at many, many EEGs, thousands of EEGs across many different patients and seeing these changes. Again, this happens to be from sleep. There's similar changes during wake. You know, in the young years, there's a lot of low frequency activity uh, and not as much high frequency activity. And then as time goes on, the high frequency activity comes to dominate a little bit more and the low frequency activity is still quite present. And then as we get older, uh, we start to see some more changes there as well. So these rhythms are not fixed. They're, they're changing over, over the lifespan as well. Uh, and then finally, in the last couple of minutes, I'm gonna very briefly talk about epilepsy. Epilepsy is sort of the canonical disease although it's not a disease, which I'll get back to, uh, for rhythms gone awry, right? It's, it's like uh, rhythms gone bad. 
Uh, it's, epilepsy has been recognized for thousands of years. The Egyptians, like many things, may have first done the first reports of it. Uh, it's also been misunderstood for all of that time as being, you know, possession and all sorts of other things that just aren't true. What it really is, is it's a state in which a patient has, or at least is at high risk for having multiple seizures. From a practical point of view, we would define it clinically as a recurrent seizure risk greater than about 60%. Really a person who's had two or more independent seizures or has a clear reason to have seizures. Uh, but it's really a symptom and not a disease. It is uh, a situation in which there are these events that are characterized by abnormal oscillations. And those oscillations evolve in time and space. And there are many different frequencies that can be involved, really all of them, that uh, during a seizure, uh, you can get uh, delta activity and gamma activity and you can get them together and riding on top of each other. Uh, so all the frequencies that are present under normal circumstances are present under, during a seizure as well, or can be present during a seizure. Here's an example of one of the most typical seizures that people talk about and think about. This is a three hertz spike wave activity in a patient who has generalized epilepsy. You can see these very large three per second events occurring here on the right side of the screen when the seizure started that's sort of happening in a very a consistent pattern, easily recognized on the EEG and have been studied for quite a while. Uh, the mechanisms of these things, we think we have a pretty good understanding of uh, that it involves the thalamocortical loops and particular uh, channels in those cells. Again, maybe not surprisingly, this is work that was uh, uh, worked out by Steriod and colleagues uh, where there's a particular sequence of events uh, involving thalamic relay neur neurons and their um, uh, uh, discharge to cortical neurons. Uh, where there's T-type channel, calcium channels that make a burst mode possible, that bursting then gives rise to the rhythmicity that we see in the three hertz spike wave and is uh, the same mechanism essentially that's present during sleep oscillations. So the concept then is that this normal rhythm, in this particular case, the sleep slow wave is co-opted or captured in a sense uh, by a, you know an abnormal variant and uh, tweaked in a way. And that's giving rise to the to the seizure in this particular case. So it's a normal mechanism that's been captured. Um, focal seizures, not generalized seizures, show even more variety and complexity with multiple rhythms. I'm just giving two examples here real quickly of seizures that start, it's on the bottom of the page here, a bunch of different uh, rhythms that start, a bunch of different frequencies that builds up and it changes over time uh, and space as well. It's another example, again, showing multiple frequency components uh, during the course of a seizure, uh, all of which could be found normally, but now are changed and modified and co-opted by this process. All right. So then in real summary that I'll run through quick so we can get to some more questions, hopefully. Uh, we see oscillations across the entire brain and across the, a, a full range of frequencies. There are generalizations that we can make about uh, the oscillations. The slower is present when somebody is less awake. Uh, slower is more widespread and more synchronous. Slower is longer and more continuous, less periodic. And that lower frequencies gate higher frequencies. Uh, first, certainly the first of those three rules are uh, sort of um, uh, honored in the breach. They are, they are quite often broken. The gamma and ripples, for example, could be synchronized across wide areas of the brain. And slow waves and spindles could be highly focal, uh, et cetera, as I talked about. There's, there's lots of mixing and matching so that these rules don't fully apply. The meta mechanisms are very heterogeneous. Uh, they're ranging from uh, oscillations that can be derived from a single neuron and the interplay of intrinsic currents to some coupling in small groups to cortical cortical and thalamocortical networks. Uh, and as uh, uh, Akshay pointed out at the very beginning, the roles of different oscillations are still essentially all correlative. There's very little causative proof yet available. It's very difficult to do, but there's more and more uh, work coming out that gets there or gets close to it or, or, or builds towards it. The presence or absence of these different frequency bands or oscillations can indicate pathology and dysfunction. And I just list a few of them here. As we see slowing in a whole range of different pathologies. Uh, we see too little gamma in, a, in those same pathologies, really. Lots of different frequencies in epilepsy. None of these are pathognomonic for a given disease or disease state, uh, but they give you some hints as to uh, what is happening and what the underlying pathophysiology might be, or at least what the consequences of that uh, disease might be. And more and more, we're turning toward thinking of them as 
targets. So uh, there's a lot of work still going on and it's still necessary for understanding the mechanisms at the single neuron, the population and the network level and getting to that causative question. Uh, and then really what we wanna do is get to a full understanding of the mechanistic links between ultimately you know, normal oscillations and then pathology, how that changes or is resulting in a change in the oscillation and how that is impacting behavioral changes or symptoms. And then finally, we want to be able to do that so we can start manipulating these oscillations using neuromodulatory techniques uh, to get back to the normal oscillation and block or change the abnormal oscillation and then restore normal function uh, to, to patients suffering from a wide range of neuromodular problems. And I'll stop there and, and um, uh, try and answer some questions that I see popping up there. Um, great. So thank so, you so uh, much. Yeah, so there's some questions in the chat. Feel free to. Yeah, I'll just go through them in the order that I see them here. Uh, uh, Bradford asks, are there studies of brainwave activity during sleep paralysis? Um, I offhand know of only one, uh, and I'm not sure it is really uh, complete. It's very hard to do because sleep paralysis is a tricky. For, for those who don't know, sleep paralysis is um, well, it depends on what you're talking about. Sleep paralysis is an entity where you actually can begin to regain consciousness from sleep, but re remain paralyzed. But for those who have ever had it, it is uh, terrifying to some people because um, you feel, uh, you know, that you're basically locked in in a way. Uh, it's it's short lived, very hard to study. I've seen it only mentioned here or there, and maybe only studied once at this point in time. We have a pretty good idea of the mechanisms that allow for the paralysis during sleep and. Uh, so, so I would expect the brainwave activity would not be terribly different, uh, but that's you know conjecture. Um, Age-related variations in epileptic seizure patterns. Uh, yes and no. The generalized seizures are generally seen, whoops, uh, uh, more prominently in in younger people, in kids. Uh, they're not seen quite as much in the adult, but they can be. Uh, and there are certain patterns that are specifically seen in kids for various reasons. For you know something called hips arrhythmia and infantile spasms have very particular uh, EEG findings that are generally not seen in adults uh, overall. But there's no specific clear cut thing that I would say is oh this is a uh, you know certain things that can only happen in a kid kind of thing. Um, So I think this, this question, so, so uh, Jeff asks, uh, do you have a sense for how degenerate the mapping is from activity neurons, particularly brain rhythms? Um, depending on exactly what you mean by this question, I think the, the mapping is certainly not very clearly one-to-one. -one. That is to say, um, slightly different mechanisms can give you, different mechanisms can give you the same rhythm. Different neuronal subtypes can give you the same rhythm. And the same rhythm can actually be generated by different mechanisms as well. That is fairly clear, at least in for a few examples. Uh, how widespread that is through the different frequency bands is not fully understood at this point. And uh, part of the real challenge is figuring out when those different mechanisms do couple to those specific rhythms and whether it matters and why it matters. So there's, there's a lot of... Um, interplay there that we still have to work out, okay? Um, right, so in, in aging, there's a question here about oscillation patterns during normal aging. So in normal, in normal healthy aging, um, there shouldn't be that much change. And in fact, one of the, thing that, one of the things that our group and, and conjunction with Brandon Westover's group has started working on is that you could actually come up with a measure of quote, brain age as distinct from chronological age, uh, based on the presence and absence of certain rhythms. And so you'll get uh, octogenarians and nonagenarians whose EEGs look like uh, you know, a 30 year old. Uh, they have all the same rhythms, right? And then you'll get folks who don't. And so the idea there is that uh, for normal aging, there hopefully or probably isn't much change uh, in the rhythms, but if there is injury, and whether that's a neurodegenerative disorder or you know, recurrent strokes or you know, accumulated injuries for other reasons, then you get uh, the sort of uh, falling apart of these rhythms in some sense and a change in the EEG that way. And usually what you see is uh, more slowing and decrease of the fast rhythms, the fast rhythms go away. Um, uh, 
Okay, I hope I'm not skipping anything here now. Sleep deprivation. Uh, yes, there's a lot of interactions between sleep and epilepsy. For most patients, uh, sleep can elicit or, well, sleep deprivation and then increased transitions from wake to sleep can elicit uh, epileptic activity or make it more likely to occur. And it's probably because of those reasons that Stereo laid out in the 90s that uh, for many of the seizures, you're actually co-opting normal mechanisms uh, that drive normal sleep op oscillations, and then you're, you're taking them over. So coming in and out of sleep are the particular times when that's going to be activated. Um, uh, so the rhythms, somebody asks about the rhythms, uh, uh, Dave Crowley asks about the rhythms detected in resting state MRI and the rhythms observed by EG. This is a, a, a yeah, there's a really complicated, long, you know, multi-session answer to this. Uh, but um, the original sort of resting state fMRI studies that were done were looking at much slower interactions than anything we're looking at here, right? They're looking at bold signals on the order of seconds. That being said, there's now a lot more work where people are associating different rhythms, alpha rhythms and other rhythms, with particular uh, resting states or particular functional networks. Uh, and associating them that way. A lot of work still needs to be done in that area, but there are some links uh, between oscillations at particular frequencies and how they're correlated over different space and underlying uh, functional networks of different uh, sorts that are detected by fMRI. Uh, so there are relationships there. They're, they're sort of complicated and still being worked out. Um, Uh, so can, can uh, uh, Zamin asks about uh, what's happening with gamma during AD and can 40 hertz delay AD progress? Well, the last question is a question that uh, a number of people around here are actively exploring and uh, forming companies around and so on is can you use gamma to uh, inhibit or at least alter uh, Alzheimer's progression? Uh, jury is still out. There's some nice data that says maybe, uh, but a lot needs to be done to figure that out. And the idea there is you are restoring the lost um, function of that oscillation uh, in some way or another. Whether that could actually delay progress, I think is, is really unclear whether that's the, that's the case. Um, and, that, and Charles asks a, a related question right after that, you know, can it be therapeutically beneficial? Again, I, I, it's something that's right now in a trial phase and, and I don't think we have a clear answer yet. So I don't wanna come down one way or the other um, on that. Uh, so EEG and MEG inverse modeling and interpretations. Now, again, uh, you know, how many hours do we have? So uh, they they are uh, definitely, um, I think, worthwhile, worthwhile, right? So so the basic question here that's being asked is, when you're recording from the scalp with any of these modalities I've talked about, the EEG, the MEG, you're getting a transformed version of the original signal, right? It's being generated in groups of neurons spread out, billions of neurons spread out across the brain, and you get basically a transformed, filtered version of it. And uh, you want to be able to go backwards and say, well, if I have that signal, what generated it and where? And that's an inverse problem. And it's an ill-posed inverse problem for those who want to think of us this in terms of you know, physics models. Uh, and so there's multiple solutions to it. You can constrain those con solutions using everything we know about biology and biophysics. And you could get pretty good estimations of where activity is coming from and what might be generating it. But they're all estimations. And that's why a lot of us like to use intracranial recordings because you can get closer to the sources and your inverse problem is uh, either to some extent non-existent or at least much easier. Um, uh, so the conjunction of being able to do these non-invasive measures and using inverse models, as well as uh, some, some in invasive recordings, uh, is key to sort of working out all these pathways, I think, and can be very powerful and has been very powerful. Uh, are they useful in clinical applications? The yes, uh, short answer to that is, is yes. We use them clinically uh, all the time. Uh, we use them ranging from a simple inverse solution that we sort of do in our heads to more complicated, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, normalized uh, inverse solution approaches that we use to map MEG responses and so on and make decisions clinically. So they are used in that, well, in that way. Um, uh, Olivia asks about non-invasive stimulation techniques. And by that, she's probably uh, uh, indicating transcranial magnetic stimulation, but there's other modalities such as alternating current and direct current stimulation as well, and you know, visual stimulation and so on. You know, how good are they at uh, modulating aberrant cortical oscillations? Um, and I think that uh, she answers her question 
herself in some ways, right? Uh, there is some controversy about, about all of this. Uh, there have been a number of clinical trials, for example, using TMS and depression uh, that have had some good results. Uh, and it is being used clinically to some extent at different, at different places. Uh, Beth Israel, for example, has a very active uh, TMS uh, research and clinical group. Um, now led by Mo Shafi, I believe. Uh, and, and so there is some indications that it can work. Now, whether it's working by realigning the oscillation in some way is really an open question, right? And, and then you get back again to the chicken and egg and what's necessary and what's sufficient there. Uh, so uh, we do have a fairly good evidence that some of these non-invasive techniques can be beneficial. Uh, whether they're beneficial because they're modulating aberrant cortical oscillations, I think is still a a pretty open question and exactly how they're doing that, if that's what they're doing, is also an open question. So uh, lots of really good questions. So uh, we're, we're 10 yeah. after the hour here. I don't know what to do next. Well, we can uh, power through as long as everyone wants and, and you have time, but there's one question that was lost in the jumble uh, oh. from Zahra. Do you agree with neurofeedback therapy for depression? Oh. Okay. So, yeah. Sorry. I missed that. I see it now at the top of my screen. Um, uh, agree or disagree. I'm not sure I'm qualified to say, uh, I, again, it's one of these things yeah, it's well outside my, um, my area of expertise, I have to admit. So take anything I say with a grain of salt. And all I would say is that I, uh, I have read that and I've talked to some folks, uh, who say that it works wonderfully. Uh, and, uh, great. If that's true, I don't know how well it is, um, uh, you know, documented through controlled clinical trials that it is a, 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 a absolutely viable technique. But again, there's folks on here who are um, far more expert than I am on that question. Uh, Anarud asks, uh, how do you think about the differences between coherence, synchrony, and co -occur? Uh So this, this is a, a great question, which gets into some technical issues of what's meant by co-occurrence and what's meant by synchrony. Um, and we could get into a very technical discussion. You could get an oscillation that occurs at the same time. So my fingers are occurring at the same time, but they might not be exactly phase locked. That is, they're not perfectly overlapped like this. They could be shifted. Maybe they're shifted exactly, or maybe they're shifted in some random way, which I can't really do with my fingers very well, um, that, that they're, they're, the, the oscillation occurred, but there was no relationship. And that's really where the coherence and the synchrony uh, comes in and how you have to define these things uh, carefully. Uh, you know, whether you're looking at something that is uh, coherent, uh, but is it actually phase synchronous or not? And it probably matters uh, a lot for some of the functional uh, capabilities or the functional impacts of these different oscillations. Having things in wild, uh, you know, spread across the brain by a few centimeters that they are, you know, actually uh, phase synchronous would have a very different mechanistic implication than if they're co-occurring. Uh, in some way. So, yeah, so definitely it's a great question and one that uh, lots of people in there, you know, in particular frequency bands are looking at closely and trying to understand where it matters and why it matters. Great. And on that note, I, I thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank great. you so much. And I want to just give a round of applause for a great session. Um, if, if you have other questions, feel free to send it our way. Um, yep. And I'd like to just say the next 101 session, it's quite relevant, is Sleep 101 uh, with our very own um, uh, Dragana Regulia, Associate Professor oh. of Neurobiology. So that's going to be in uh, February 3rd. So Great. thanks again, Dr. Cash. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. And happy to field more questions offline if, if people want. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.